Today on Faith Matters, we are continuing our Faith Basics series on the Holy Spirit. I have Mark Frankian in the studio with me, and we're going to be talking about the Holy Spirit's role in the Old Testament. I'm Dan Jarms, and you're listening to Faith Matters, a podcast to help update you on matters of Faith Bible Church, as well as equip you in matters of the Christian faith. Welcome, Mark. Hi, Dan. As a lead off, I just want to say often, I, and maybe I might be guilty of this. I know a lot of my very cerebral friends might be very guilty of this. We think of the Holy Spirit in impersonal terms, especially when we use the personal pronoun it for the Holy Spirit instead of he. On the other side, I've got a little bit of a charismatic background. So the other error is that the Holy Spirit is, you know, magic incantation juice or he, he's the special power. And we're going we're gonna to try to clear that up. Uh, here's one thing, Mark, and I want you to hear and take away is that uh, the Holy Spirit of the three members of the Trinity, his role is the most intimate in the world and in the believer's life. And, and we can take that from lots of places, but one of those we can take that from is Romans 8, where we know Christ is interceding for us. He is interceding for us in heaven. The Holy Spirit's interceding for us within. So there should be a lot of interest in the Holy Spirit. He is the closest member of the Trinity to us in this world in all the Trinity's work. Now, that's just saying the roles of the Trinity because God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit are all equally present everywhere. So we're not trying to say about that. But when we think of the Holy Spirit's role, he is intentionally uh, very intimate with us. So... What struck me was rereading Genesis 1-2, where it says that the Spirit of the Lord hovered over the face of the waters. So here you have God's powerful ruach, that's the Hebrew word, wind, power, hovering over the face, and, and that portrays a very intimate connection with creation. So from the beginning, the Holy Spirit has been the uh, member of the Trinity who's been most intimately connected to the material of the world and intimately connected to our lives. Uh, Mark, your interest in this has been uh, somewhat theological about uh, the difference between what happens in the Old Testament, what happens in the New Testament, and there's some mistakes we can make with that. Why don't you talk about some of that general work? For me, I mean, honestly, I don't remember exactly where it came from or what I was taught specifically over the years, but uh, I do remember some time ago just reading through the Old Testament. I've been doing that for a long time now, reading through scripture every year and uh, just being struck with a variety of things uh, in the Old Testament and how intimate they were. You know, even Psalm 139, uh, Yahweh, you've searched me and known me. You know, when I sit down and rise up, you understand my thought from afar and and so on. Uh, There's just a lot of Psalm 42, you know, thirst for God as a deer pants for water. Uh, just just a lot of, of maybe different terms, but a lot of the same concepts mm-hmm. as we read through the Old Testament and consider what did the original author mean to the original audience and and those issues and how we understand uh, a believer's life then. that That's really the, been the catalyst for me over the years mm-hmm. as I keep mm-hmm. reading and keep growing in my understanding of that topic. Yeah. yeah, maybe I think it's out of... Genesis 5, where we find that men began to call on the name of the Lord, or Enoch walked with God. There was an intimate personal connection. Yeah. So sometimes you can get the idea that the Old Testament saints had a very distant um, relationship with God. And I think we get that because many of the Old Testament figures, like the nation of Israel, was generally indifferent to God or idolatrous. So when we look at the whole of the nation, we can confuse the whole of the nation with the remnant or the true believers, and the true believers did have an intimate walk with God. The Holy Spirit's vital. Right, no question. And uh, we we don't want to commit the fallacy. You mentioned uh, the word thing fallacy, Mm -hmm. that if a certain word is not used in the Old Testament, then then it's not there in any way, shape, or form. So that's just just not the case. Uh, Yes, the New Testament does provide greater detail in a lot of ways and even uses some different terms. 
and I'm, say, I'm not saying everything is identical, and we'll get to that, but, right. uh, but there, there is an intimacy with believers in the Old Testament, I think, that's very similar to the New. What are the ministries of the Holy Spirit? What, is, what did he do in the Old Testament, saints? Yeah, I'd say you mentioned one, uh, being present in creation and having a role in creation, Genesis 1-2, for example, um, uh, being active in salvation and regeneration. Uh, Romans 4 speaks of Abraham as uh, his faith uh, being what brought about righteousness in his life in the same way as New Testament saints. So nothing has changed there. Um, so creation, salvation, uh, restraining sin is uh, is ongoing, uh, both in old and new. Uh, inspiring the scriptures, uh, 2 Timothy 3, 2 Peter 1, speak of that. Illuminating a believer, uh, even Psalm 119, 18, again, Old Testament verse, open my eyes that I may behold wonderful things from your law. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's the same. And then, uh, again, whatever you call it, indwelling or abiding or uh, spiritual dynamics of a, of a believer's life, mm -hmm. I think uh, some mm -hmm. real uh, similarities there, if not identical things there. I remember starting to reason through this um, on, on my way to seminary, in seminary, and and that was the thought from Ephesians 2, for instance, you were dead in your sins and trespasses, and you've been made alive in Christ. And you just continue to unpack that made alive is by the regenerating work of the Holy Spirit. Jesus tells Nicodemus, uh, you should have known better that you needed to be born again. Aren't you an Old Testament teacher? So something about the Old Testament. But my Old Testament profs, uh, Dr. Crisanti, would say, an Old Testament saint was dead in sin. Something, someone needed to make him alive to God. So naturally, the Old Testament saint the true believer in the Old Testament had to be born again, had to be had to have the operation of the work of the Holy Spirit to help them be born again, help them to see, help them to have faith. Um, all of those works that are really clear to see in the New Testament had to be true in the Old Testament. Otherwise, you would have people who could believe on their own, but then f fall away from the faith. So uh, it's an, it's a natural connection. You have to. Man's not changed. Right. If you really read the Old Testament in a very plain way, you'll actually find that's true over and over. Deuteronomy 30 verse 6 promises that any, any genuine believer needs to have a circumcised heart. Right. So God promises to circumcise the, the heart, the inside of a person. Yeah, I, th I think just uh, like the Trinity is an example. We, we see aspects of the Trinity in the Old Testament, but it's it's uh, clarified and expanded in the new, so yeah. it doesn't change what's in the old, even if different terms and different ways of saying it are there. If you call it a circumcised heart in some places in the Old Testament or um, indwelling in the new or, or born again, yeah, yeah, same idea. There, there are some things that are uh, fun to see, and I wouldn't necessarily say unique, but we get our start from them in the Old Testament. So we talk about indwelling, where the Spirit of the Lord comes to and dwell inside a believer. What we see in the Old Testament are some specific functions. So filling, for instance. What do we see when God fills different people in the Old Testament? Yeah, in the Old Testament, uh, the way it's worded, it seems to limit itself to um, craftsmen or, or workers, the, the spirit coming on them, or prophets, or kings, or priests. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't doesn't speak of uh, uh, an otherwise normal uh, believing Old Testament saint that way. Yeah, and it, we wouldn't say that they weren't, but what we see in the record is that when God wanted to work, he would fill or empower a person or a set of people for some specific tasks. So yeah, the, the craftsmen um, who made all the furniture for the temple were were empowered by the Holy Spirit, filled with the Holy Spirit, with special wisdom, special skill. Uh, one of one of the ways you see that then prophets were filled. You find you see po prophets were filled with with the Lord. When you look at Elijah, sometimes he's filled with the Spirit. He speaks, and then sometimes the Spirit just literally picks him up or allows him this supernatural running ability to run away. Like we see these special operations of the Holy Spirit in the filling. So David's filled with the Spirit. Even some uh, some um, very disobedient servants are filled with the Holy Spirit, like Saul, a number of times, is filled with the Holy Spirit to prophesy. And, and that's almost, comically, that's almost how God keeps Saul from doing so many horrible things. 
He just overpowers him with the Holy Spirit, and he he can't go kill David. Yeah. He, he prophesies instead. Uh, so there's some there's some interesting things. So we we have that special filling. Uh, one of the aspects that's then uh, often uh, considered is can can a person in the Old Testament lose their salvation? And David makes that statement. Uh, Psalm 32. Yeah, don't take your spirit from me. Yeah, don't take your spirit from me. And I'm in, I'm in the camp of the commentators that would say, don't take your theocratic anointing. So kings in the Old Testament were anointed with special power by God to rule effectively. And I think when David's saying, take not your Holy Spirit from me, he's saying, don't remove me as king. There's, there's some debate about that, uh, but, but I look at that as that, that filling that was part of his theocratic anointing. He says, I don't, I don't want to lose my place as king. I, you promised the Messiah to come through my line. I, I don't want to lose that. Uh, so I would, I would take it that way. And then with that filling, you'll see a variety of things. People who did not have the spirit, suddenly anointed by the spirit, had special abilities to speak for God, prophets. Uh, sometimes, sometimes kings were also prophets where they could speak for God. Uh, we would see special miracles that they had. The uh, Moses had those, Elijah, Elisha. Um, Elisha asked for a double portion of what Elijah had. And then when you read in Second Kings, he had this interesting extra power. And, and it's almost as if before it happened and after it happened, all the people around could see something was different. Oh, you've been anointed by the Holy Spirit. So it's a unique kind of situation in the Old Testament that we, uh, that we see there. And that does lead us to uh, some thoughts about the New Testament uh, or the New Covenant. Um, Mark, what are, your, what are your thoughts on what we see um, starting to change? Or what, what do we see about realities from how the Holy Spirit operated in the Old Testament to the New Testament? Well, I think we see uh, in Acts 2 uh, the start of the church. So with, with uh, all the events in Acts 2 and the works of the Spirit there, uh, beginning this new uh, people of God, the church, um, and bringing people, uh, baptizing them in the Spirit into the church. Um, so I think that's one, I think related to that are, is the gifting of the Holy Spirit for the church, uh, each, each member of a church, each believer in the New Testament. I think those are probably two of the biggest immediate differences between uh, Mosaic or Old Testament, Holy Spirit's work in New Testament. Yeah, yeah, and it's, a, it, it's really a matter of scope as, a, as opposed to specifics because the Holy Spirit did the same kinds of things in saints of the Old Testament. Um, but. Uh, two things that really help us think about the transition is that the transition of the scope of the Holy Spirit's work um, started a prediction even in Deuteronomy 30, where the, there was a covenant nation. God made a covenant with Israel under the leadership of Moses and under the law of Moses. And yet, God would say over and over, your hearts aren't circumcised. Deuteronomy 30 promises a coming time in which all the members of the covenant community are going to have circumcised hearts. So all the way back there, we have this promise of some operation. And then when we get to Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel, um, you know, several of the prophets, Hosea, the minor prophets, Hosea and Joel, all talk about a coming covenant and a key element of that coming, coming covenant besides Christ's atoning work is the operation of the Holy Spirit. And Ezekiel 36 is, is where one of the, my favorite places to go with this because in Ezekiel 36, 26, it says, I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. It's often difficult for us to understand Jesus' words uh, his promise, the Holy Spirit, he, he, he is with you, but he will be in you. And we're not often sure what the difference is um, about that. But one of the things we are sure about is the scope. Every believer has this washing and regeneration uh, in, in the Old Testament and the New. 
Right. Yeah. Whatever. However, you're going to explain old, the, the sort of the normal Old Testament saint. Uh, by the time we get to the New Testament, in the church clearly each believer has the Spirit and is gifted for, you know, Ephesians four, First Corinthians twelve and fourteen about being in the body, being um, equipped uh, by the pastor, teacher, leader, leadership, uh, equipping ministries to do the work of the service, building up the body of Christ, mm-hmm. and spreading the gospel yeah, around so, the world. So that that's that filling or special empowerment is actually extended to every everything. And that's that's really the, the main point of Joel chapter two that Peter quotes in Acts chapter two. So in Joel chapter two, there's this promise that your young men will see visions, your old men will dream dreams. And I'm, I'm probably paraphrasing that, but all of those things are going to happen. Uh, and which which means every new covenant member is going to speak for God. And in Acts chapter two, that actually spread out to the nations because people from various nations were going to hear and speak for God too. Without the theocracy of the Old Testament where God essentially pulls his people together in the land of Israel under uh, ideally an obedient king, uh, he instead spreads them out through uh, the spread of the gospel and the spirit and the word of God uh, into the various churches and takes a different approach. One other ministry that we see the Holy Spirit has is the ministry of restraint. So one of the things that the Holy Spirit does since he's intimate in the work of the world is restraining the sinfulness of man. Starting in Genesis 6, verse 3, the Holy Spirit was grieved, no longer wanted to contend against the wicked and evilness of the world. And so God instituted a worldwide judgment, restarted with Noah and his sons. Um, how else do we see that restraining today? Um, yeah, that continues in the New Testament, uh, Second Thessalonians 2, 7. Uh, sorry, beginning in verse 6, actually, or even verse 5. Second Thessalonians 2, 5. Do you not remember that while I was still with you, I was telling you these things? He's been talking about some uh, end times eschatological events. Verse 6, and you know what restrains him now so that in his time he will be revealed. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. So there's a current ministry of restraint by the Holy Spirit, we would say. Yeah, which which is another reason to worship and thank the Holy Spirit. So if if you are a, a newspaper reader, you know, if you're, you see the wars or you, you feel, if you're a culture warrior, uh, like you feel like what was good and right in the world seems to be turned upside down and you're grieved about that, you can give thanks to the Holy Spirit of God that he restrains. It could be much worse. Yeah, it could praise be God much worse. Yep. May, praise God it's not worse than it is, but he does restrain. And one day, uh, just, just as the judgment on mankind will come, preparing for the return of Christ, the Holy Spirit will be taken away in that restraining role and men will do far more wicked things than they do now. Proving God's righteousness when Christ returns that man's ready to be be judged. Ready to be judged, yeah. Um, Anything else that you had in your notes? You know, Deuteronomy 29, 29, what God reveals uh, is for us and for us to pass on to the next generations. And what he doesn't reveal is uh, for him. Uh, so we, we don't know everything, Old or New Testament, but uh, what he does, we can we can use and learn and grow and apply to our lives and help each other uh, appreciate and uh, worship our triune God. What are the things that are most uh, soul encouraging, soul stirring about the ministry of the Holy Spirit as we start to see it in the Old Testament? I would say uh, what Paul says in Acts 17 to the Greek philosophers that God has always, uh, uh, through history, through time, through his work around the world, uh, done things that men would seek God. Mm. So whatever situation we're in, uh, Adam and Eve, uh, the fall, uh, whatever it might be, uh, as we read what it was like for them, as we look at our lives today uh, with one another, God is at work to help us seek him mm. through that and his spirit. Uh, in that same chapter, Acts 17 and others, he is not far from us. Call out to God and he is there. 
Yeah, the the reality that God is near through his Holy Spirit, so near that he's actually inside us. Yeah. Uh, I, I remember the first time learning about that going through the book of Ephesians in a campus Bible study on the campus of Eastern just blew me away that that God's spirit would dwell. And, and I consider uh, how dirty, corrupt, vile the remaining sin is. And I, I, that blows me away that he would yeah. endure. Um, it's enough for God the Father on the throne, the Son on the throne, present everywhere to have to endure, but God in us? To me, that's, that's really precious mercy and grace from the Spirit of God. Yeah, really, really convicting on the one hand, like you yeah. said, that God knows every thought, and at the same time, encouraging that we live life before God. He knows everything. I'm not fooling him in any way, shape, or form, even if I can fool you or someone else. It's yeah. just where he knows. No reason to be proud. No reason to be uh, hiding things. Just yeah. uh, we can confess and repent and, and grow by the grace of God. I think the other one that really is uh, an important one for me is that uh, the Holy Spirit, he is the one who moves our holiness. So he's called the Holy Spirit for a reason, the spirit of holiness. And he's the one who empowers our growth to shed sinful habits, to build new character, so that new life that's given through the Holy Spirit is also a progressively holy life. Uh, and that, that's really important understanding about the Holy Spirit. And we often take that for granted. We, we forget, we, we, mentally we think we can, we can shut the door, uh, hide in a room, and God doesn't see us, and yet God is in us, wanting and, and pushing for our holiness. Yeah, look forward to getting to know him more in our days here and uh, in the next stage as well. All right. Mark, thank you for this time. It's been exciting to, thank you. to take a look at this doctrine. Ditto. 